Okay, I'm going to do a quick review of my middle school Latin teacher's Ph.D. thesis on St. Augustine. And this was done in the 1980s. And I had no idea she was a Ph.D. Um, doctor, a doctor of, it was like probably in the department of uh, classics. And she actually went back to become a professor at uh, University of Minnesota. I think also, um, I think like St. Thomas and also like um, maybe like Good Day, Good Day. Davis Adolphus, maybe there too, 1983. So this is a very complicated, impressive, and well-written PhD thesis. And the basic... Um, it has, to, it's, has to do with the origin of the soul and the debate in the Christian church about how that's related to baptism. And basically, at first, um, St. Augustine wanted to focus on introspection and philosophy in terms of like the Socratic method of, he was highly influenced by um, Platonic philosophy. Um, but then um, he felt obligated to focus more on rhetoric because of the these debates in the church um, about what was heretical and on the origin of the soul. And the big debate at the time was whether the soul is directly made of the same substance of God or it's separated from the substance of God and therefore by original sin. And again, this has to do with the um, Greek influence on Christianity, also the Platonic philosophy and Aristotle, and basically that um, the idea of the Logos, of course, as um, supposedly the reason of God, but um, if you, of course, I have a different understanding of the Logos than is was claimed by the Stoics as given in this PhD thesis. But I was surprised to learn that um, St. Augustine, he did see light when he meditated, when he prayed, he saw light inside him. And so he thought that that was, that you had to make that connection with light um, internally to access a connection to the Holy Spirit. Um, so the, the idea, the, there's a lot of ambiguity about like the word anima and related to whether it's related to spirit or soul and then how that's related to, um, the old Testament of Genesis and the, um, Greek word of noumena, noumena for soul, um, and basically, as she points out, that um, Augustine takes the position of a Socratic uh, philosophy view based on the maxim of know thyself with the self being inherently um, based on logical inference. So you, it's what you would call formless awareness in um, non-Western philosophy. Which also, you know, in non in like Vedic philosophy, they have the same 
idea of the self as um, I am that I am, which would be the I is the source of the I thought, and then the am would be this formless awareness that can only be logically inferred, and what Augustine would consider to be like ignorance of like conceptual thinking. So you have you can't put it into conceptual words, and therefore you have to rely on that logical inference or what in religion would be considered to be faith, faith or hope. And so his argument is that, that those type of concepts of faith, hope, and, and compassion as love are different than our senses, than our spirit based on perception of the senses. And so that, that type of um, spiritual conception then connects us back to our soul through this type of prayer or meditation and but um due to original sin therefore um, baptism is required for the soul to actually reunite back with god um and it has to be a baptism of both water and spirit now or spirit in terms of um, alchemy, that would be the fire, the spirit is fire. So you can see the connections back to alchemy, whether it's Egyptian or Pythagorean. If you know, if you already know the secrets of alchemy, you can see that in here. But of course, by this time, which is, we're talking the 300s to 400s, early 400s, um, this book that she translated, she gave a new translation and commented on was, I think, written in the early 400s. And basically, um, at that point, they were very fixated on these like conceptual um, differences about baptism and various different beliefs and deciding what's heretical. There were different heretical movements, so you could get like excommunicated if you had the wrong conceptual beliefs. And so these are some of the um, the un unacceptable implications of the soul, that the souls are propagated like bodies from the first man called traducianism, that souls are created anew for each single person, the theory called creationism, that souls are sent into bodies by God from some pre-existent state, and that souls go into bodies of their own accord. Reluctance to admit a pre-existent soul kept Augustine from considering the last two alternatives seriously. So that leaves Traducianism and Creationism. And so then we have his difficulty lay in choosing one of the first two. Although he was impressed by J Jerome's support for creationism, naturally the advocates of either view based their claim on scripture, but Augustine easily demonstrated that every scriptural text offered as a proof of one position could just as well be interpreted in favor of the other. A worse problem was that either position would apparently violate either human reason or divine authority. So, so then they get into original sin. Now, what's fascinating to me is that sin, in my view, sin was the lunar god of Samaria. And so, in fact, this, this original sin has to do with the um, Professor David Noble, David F. Noble, he talks about this in his final book called The Myth of the Promised Land. And he goes back to show, you know, how the Sumerian um, Garden of Eden, Eden story was actually different. And so when you realize that sin literally meant the moon god of Sumeria, and that was based on music ratios as well, then it starts to change. Like you start to understand religion differently. And when you realize the lunar energy is actually a psychic, a psychic like electrogravitic um physiology, psychophysiology of the third eye of the pineal gland, 
um, a good book on that is the uh, Sri Yukteswar's book, The Holy um, Science. And he goes into biblical scriptures and he connects the Bible back to um, yoga, yoga training, yoga philosophy of the Vedic philosophy. But of course, that would all be considered a heretical by um, St. Augustine. So as I'm saying at this point in time, you know, they were a long ways off from like the Logos being a Pythagorean philosophy. Um, so she goes, it goes on and on. It's very detailed. And then um, the, the, in my view, the issue here has to do with the perception of listening as from based on music and music and the secret of music theory as non commutativity. And so this is very much focused on spatial, a definition of God as a spatial um, definition and what that means and how you relate to that to the soul in the body and all the paradoxes that that creates. And in my view, all those paradoxes are solved by realizing the truth of reality is not um, spatial, but it's actually uh, inherent uh, frequency and time based on listening to the source of music as the uh, original meaning of the logos. Of course, I couldn't, you know, I was, when I took this class in middle school, I was, of course, intrigued, intrigued because of my music uh, training I think I took, I didn't take music theory till maybe I was like, it might have been when I was in middle school when I was taking this Latin class. Actually, it was, I think it was when I was like 15 or 16. I think it was probably when I was 16. Yeah, I took it when I was 16. So it would have been after, a year after. And actually, this, her son was in the same grade as me, and he invited me to her, to their house. And then his father was a minister and uh, the name Preuss, Preuss is a very um, prominent, prominent name in the uh, Lutheran church. So he was a Lutheran, Lutheran minister and the son went on to be a prominent um, artist. He's been an artist in uh, Chicago. So he had me over to his house for an overnight in middle school. And I'm sure I would think that would have been um, based on the his mom, because I I really liked the Latin class, but um, I was, you know, I we didn't after that overnight. We you know we stayed friends. We didn't we didn't hang out anymore after that. But um, I'm I'm kind of like more of a hermit. I was always more of a hermit, even in middle school. I had gone to public schools up until. This was at a private uh, Christian school, and so it was a bit of a culture shock for me. And that might have been, they were maybe trying to help me out with that. Actually, my great aunt was the Latin teacher at the same school, at this Mihaha Academy. So she was, um, my own family has a, a long connection with this um, school. It was started by a Swedish uh, evangelical preacher in in Minneapolis and so my great aunt taught Latin and so maybe maybe Mrs. Preuss knew about my great aunt teaching Latin there I don't know but um probably not anyway by the time but I have I have a neighbor who actually he st he studies the whole history of the Swedish um church the different Swedish denominations in the U.S. and whatever, Minnesota, around the world, I suppose. Um, he's been given, like, some award by the Swedish government, like one of their secret societies or whatever. <laughs> what do you call it? The, one of their royal orders. He's in the he's inducted into the royal order in Sweden. Okay, so so yeah, this is so the it's it's kind of hard to 
like obviously when you get get into the weeds of these arguments, um, I had never really, you know, I thought I found it fascinating to be honest about the baptism stuff and um, but you know they're relying on Justin Martyr and also on um, Papius Papius. Um, is that how you say his name? P A P P I A S. Pop P A P Papius. Yeah, Papius. So yeah, there's actually she gets into hearing, she gets into listening right here. Um the Plato deplores the effect of writing on people's memories. And And then, let's see. Yeah, this. so here we get into the Logos. The Logos is in what they call, she just says the word, in John, John's prologue. That's identified with Jesus. So Jesus is the Logos. Now, um, Logos... Right, so, um, to be sure, now there's a whole book about this um, by Marian, Professor Marion Hiller, who I've corresponded with, on the Logos and the Trinity, and it's really fascinating. He basically argues that um, that Tertullian, Tertullian um, was relying on um, Platonic philosophy to basically create the concept of the Trinity, that it's directly lifted lifted from neoplatonism and so she she's distinguishing it from a neoplatonic worldview but um but that book the Marion Hiller book gets into how that happened how it got historicized oh here's Papius see to collect eyewitness traditions so I actually looked this up. I looked into this Papius' statement about to rely on eyewitness traditions instead of the um, written word. And the problem is, is that the Papius' eyewitnesses are very, they're not very um, authoritarian. Um, what's the word? They're not authoritarian. Uh, authoritative no, I can't think of it um yeah authoritative is that right Authorit. anyway um authoritative authoritative there we go so I think I'm like having I'm I'm having a Greek Latin <laughs> flashback here <laughs> um okay the old platonic distinction so, um, and of course, you know, if they're relying on Papias as like the original source for the whole Christian claims, well, that's problematic. That's, that's highly problematic. But the, but as a philosophy based on reason, the Augustine still, you know, it's, it's his, I had actually my minister, um, in my, at my own church when I was going through confirmation, he encouraged me to study Augustine. He thought I would, I'd be interested in Augustine. So I'm glad I'm finally, you know, studying him more from this PhD thesis. And so, of course, you know, you have to like decipher the Greek because she doesn't translate the Greek. Sometimes she does, but um, all right. So anyway, oh, here we go. The inner conversation with God must ultimately be speechless. So this is what I found fascinating from um, that Augustine believed that the 
inner conversation must ultimately be speechless. And then he saw light internally. So he did have like this mystic um, connection. And so I could see why my um, minister wanted me to study Augustine because he's like, you know, he obviously could tell I had like that mystic. Um, but Augustine, he obviously is not like a yogi master. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, he ends up, Augustine ends up, like, getting into this hardcore debate with these other theologians. And that's, doesn't, here's the only Christian love, Caritas, can supply this interconnection between the the hearer and the speaker. So Augustine's concern is to make a human match between the intent of the speaker and the learning capacity of what he calls the hearer. And only Christian love can supply this interconnection. So that's really that's really fascinating. Like that is like a yogi, you know, kind of mystic um, connection. And that he could see light internally. So I feel like he still had sort of a, you know, like a connection. Um, and actually, I'm about to read, I'm about to read um, Evelyn's, Evelyn, uh, what's her last name? But she wrote a book on mysticism in the early 1900s. I think her last name's like Hiller or something. No, it's not. I just said Hiller, so it's not. It's an H. It has the H last name, though. I post a link on my blog. Um, so he'll, she'll probably, t you know, discuss Augustine, I would guess. So that's about it. I'm, I'm approaching a half hour on this video. And... The end of the um, PhD thesis has the actual translation of the book that she's discussing. And so it's it's really impressive and I'm glad she you know she was able to be a professor. So she didn't just keep teaching middle school, but I was very very lucky to have her as a middle school teacher. Um and I had no idea she had a PhD. She was a doctor. But of course, she her PhD was on humility, on how Augustine emphasizes humility. Um, so, um, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty cool stuff. Um, but. In the end, in the end, it's sort of like a part of the empire. <laughs> it's like empire light. I missed this before. The... The, the Israelites to spoil the Egyptians of their gold? I never heard about that. <laughs> What's that about? Okay, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, the thing about baptism is basically they're saying, well, if you, if you aren't baptized, you can't, you can't, like reunite with God afterwards so you're like stuck you can at best like get to like a lower level of heaven or something like that but then she he um Augustine critiques um Paul and Peter as apostles I think it's Peter anyway the idea that um they can't really know these different levels of heaven or whatever like there's a reference to the third level of heaven by Paul and I didn't know about that but basically, Augustine's like, well, he's not really clear. Paul wasn't clear, so how can we know? And 
point out that when Augustine's method and vocabulary are, quote, Socratic, is not to press any particular theory about the, but merely to observe that, like the Socrates known to Latin tradition, Augustine plays ironically with the ideas of knowing and not knowing, admits his own ignorance, and occasionally harries his opponents. So there you go. Pretty much sums it up. Um, sorry, I didn't lost the focus on this thing. There you go, I've got some focus now. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely an impressive work. She, she writes really well, just like, goes into all the details. The search for self-knowledge was an important, rather a necessary exercise for the Christian in Augustine's view. So this brings it back to that know thyself. And I actually, we, we studied Plato a lot in my, at uh, this, this was at Minnehaha Academy was the name of the school. So in high school, the Bible class there, there was a big focus on, on this know thyself, which I thought, you know, that kind of like struck home for me and then got me into more like the Vedic um, vichara, what they call it, which is the source of the I thought. What is the source of the I thought in uh, philosophy, in meditation? And again, the idea of being that listening through music, you can you can bypass these um, logical paradoxes between knowing and not knowing, um, which I, I won't get into all that right now. So, so part of the problem is like when they talk about the um, Trinity again, they're saying it's the same substance of God. That, but the, the question then is like, well, what is the substance? What is the substance? And that sort of like gets you back to alchemy, in my view, if you can really study alchemy. <laughs> um, but the, of course, you know, Augustine's view is that the, because of original sin, you have this um, disconnect between God and the soul and that's why you need baptism and the baptism of both water and spirit. And it's, you know, I can't help but see the alchemy connections when I read this stuff. But if you didn't, if you hadn't studied alchemy, you would never know. <laughs> and, and Augustine, obviously, he didn't know the connection, you know, because, but, um, and so anyway, he, Basically, Augustine like outwitted all of his critics who were criticizing him, and he criticized them back, and he sort of like survived. And so, um, He just holds on to this like Socratic viewpoint, and that's that's cool. That's good by me. Um, of course, it doesn't get into the whole mathematical problems with that. Um, but of course, this is only the fourth century, pretty much. <laughs> the, so, um, anyway. Thanks for this PhD thesis that I checked out. And it got reviewed. It got reviewed on, in the academic literature, which is cool. Right on. And she took us on field trips and stuff. We had a lot of fun. <laughs>